Okay, we're gonna get started because there's a lot to cover. Um, my name is Travis Clifton. So a couple of things about this talk. It's uh, it's a lot of information and I don't expect everybody to remember all of it. Um, so this covers a lot of trials. Most of them at the beginning, I'm gonna kind of flow through pretty quickly and just hit the high points. And the point of it is not for you to remember a trial that was done 50 years ago. I don't think you need to do that. It's mainly to give you sort of a sense of how breast cancer treatment has evolved. So generally speaking, these trials are arranged chronologically, although I kind of moved a couple of them around so that they're sort of like trials that were done um, to just hit those points. The other is it doesn't cover everything. It's, it is sort of oriented towards surgical and ad, stuff that more pertains to us. So there's not a lot of metastatic breast cancer trials in here. Um, I will kind of make a point when we get to the trials that you probably should, you know, be able to repeat the name of, and that's more towards the end of it. And the other thing is, you know, th this is something that, um, you know, I know fairly well just because it's like what I focus in, but you guys focus in a lot. And so just keep in mind that, you know, I give this talk every year, sometimes twice a year, and you'll get more out of it each time. You don't ex don't expect it seems overwhelming. I know that, uh, but that's okay. Um, okay, so let's get going. Um, so one of the points I think that that I think it's important to remember uh, when you look at this is that when you when you hear us debating in, in BC4, a lot of it's because we're sort of stuck with the legacy of what's come before. And if you look at, like in the big picture, surgery came first for most treatment of, of cancers, and then radiation came after that, then you got chemotherapy, and so you're sort of grappling with it. But in general, you know, the way we approach stuff is you have to prove that any new therapy um, is better than what came before it, uh, or at least not worse, plus has less treatment effects, whatever, or side effects, things like that. But the, the kind of the point of the, that is you know, if you look at how things evolved, surgery came first, and it was really big morbid surgery. But you can imagine if like all of a sudden we came up with modern anesthesia and aseptic technique that we might be trying to add in surgery now, and it would be much different. We'd have to like prove that this surgery, you know, doing an axillary dissection, I don't know that we could prove that it was an okay thing to do now, but instead we started with that. And so we have to prove that it's not it's okay to pull back from that um anyway it, it just so some of the things we do you know and in, invariably in 15 years we will think of i can't believe we used to do that um just like people 15 years ago you know i would think of things that people did 15 years ago that way uh but it's sort of what's just how evidence-based medicine works but you know in general cancer wasn't thought of as a cure potentially curable disease um, until the late 1800s, and that corresponded with basically the ability to do more complicated and um, bigger operations because of two things, uh, anesthesia and asepsis. And so um, this, there's actually a really good uh, biography about Halstead, but it's, um, Halstead kind of changed the way we thought about cancer in particular, and that was primarily with his work on breast cancer. But he came up with sort of the Halsteadian theory of breast cancer, which was the dominant theory um, really until kind of the 60s and 70s. But the idea basically is that tumor spreads in an orderly manner, uh, and it's based on mechanical considerations. So um, it goes through the lymphatics. And uh, this part's important that if you cut through a lymphatic to a breast cancer, when you are taking it out, you know, you'll spill the cancer out of the lymphatics and then the patient will have, you know, recur and die because you basically, you know, did an inadequate operation. Now that, you know, we don't think that way anymore. And, you know, the, the, the current practice patterns like doing a lumpectomy obviously cuts through lymphatics when we do that. And that's not shown to be worse or things like that. So um, we don't think that way anymore. But this is why, you know, they did these crazy operations that we think about um, before. Um, you know, the other thing is regional lymph nodes are of anatomic importance for prognosis or for uh, outcomes. We know that lymph node involvement is important, but it's, I think the accumulated data would suggest it's more important from a prognostic standpoint than 
you know, a, then the Halsteadian idea of that if you can just cut ahead of the cancer, you'll cure those patients. Um, the bloodstream is of little significance as a route of tumor spread. Um, the tumor is autonomous of its host. We also don't think that way anymore. Um, but that operable breast cancer is a local regional disease. And then really the extent and nuances of the operation are the dominant factor that influences patient outcome. That again, sort of, you know, it, not to say that um, the nuances of the operation aren't important, they are, but it's probably not the dominant driver of outcomes. It's, it's really the biology more than anything. But again, the sort of overarching theme was if you have a patient with breast cancer and keep in mind, they didn't have PET scans, you know, this is just, they didn't have any obvious metastatic disease. You needed to do a big operation up front and that was the best chance of curing the patient. Um, so that led to the Halsteadian radical mastectomy, which is removal of, you know, different than we do now, the features are removal of most of the skin, the pec major and minor, and then complete axillary dissection. And so the reason you did that is because of those lymphatics. So you didn't take the pec major because there was tumor involved or you couldn't tell because you could tell the tumor is free of that. It's because there's lymphatics that traverse those muscles to get to the axillary nodes. And so you had to take it all in block if you wanted to get it out. Um, and having, I've done a radical mastectomy once, it makes the axillary dissection like super easy. Um, and so uh, anyway, not something that many of us will likely do. Um, so then, uh, you know, he reported his outcomes and keep in mind, you know, this is sort of probably, this is the standard of the, at the time, but, you know, follow-up isn't great and things like that, but basically reported a three-year cure rate of 45%, which was dramatically better than anyone had ever reported before that. Um, and and um, so that that basically at that time immediately became the standard of care. Keep in mind, this kind of corresponded with as anesthesia became more available and, and, and asepsis was uh, evolving, you know, at a time where this seemed much more approachable operation to, to most surgeons in general. You know, if you talk about doing it even here, um, um, you know, doing a, what Halstead describes probably seemed uh, impossible. But now, you know, both it's it's capable of being done and look, the recurrence, you know, the, the survival now all of a sudden breast cancer is a surgical disease. So, the, you know, as this happened, people started to know, you know, doing autopsy studies, things like that, that sometimes the internal mammary nodes were involved. And so this led to the concept of the super radical mastectomy. Keep in mind that, you um, this was, you know, it never got widespread adoption. It was done sort of in specialty centers or, or centers that sort of were true believers in it. And it was, it was definitely abandoned in the modern era of randomized trials, stuff like that. But it, it was being done into the 60s even. Um, and this was also a very paternalistic era of medicine. Um, so it wasn't like the patients had a lot of, I, don't, I can't imagine there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the risks and benefits and things like that. And then in, when they report the results of this to include, you know, Halstead, things like that, there's very little report of like functional outcomes, morbidity, things like that. It's just all they cared about was cancer recurrence. But the Halstead or the uh, super radical mastectomy, there's various ways it's described, but the, kind of the key feature is that you want to remove those internal mammary nodes because they could be involved. And keep in mind, again, there's no PET scans. It's not like we know they're involved. They just might be involved. Um, but the, the point is you can't cut through those lymphatics to get there. So you had to remove in block, you know, the medial portion of the chest wall to get those nodes out without disrupting the lymphatics. And so you ended up with these, these giant operations uh, like that. So now that's how things were for about 60 years. So we'll talk about some other treatments. So along comes Bernard Fisher, Bernie Fisher. This guy is like, I think, one of the most important figures in cancer care anyway. Um, so he was in charge of the NSABP. Does anybody know what the NSABP is? Yeah, National Surgical, there's, there should be two Bs, but it, bowel, and best, brow, bowel and Breast Product, or Breast and Bowel Product, I can't remember. Um, so uh, it's a N, NIH-sponsored cooperative group and, and still does some of the most important trials because you got to think about it. You know, When you look at big trials, there's lots of big trials in medical oncology, but invariably there's a pharmaceutical company funding it. You know, for surgical stuff or for drugs that are, you know, now now don't have any patent protection or sort of 
uh, generic drugs, no one's going to fund these big trials. And so this is where the NIH, but Bernie Fisher really came in and, you know, promoted the randomized controlled trial for these, which was at the time, you know, kind of a crazy idea. There were people even in, I mean, even the 80s and 90s who would say, you know, randomized trials are for people who are like, aren't smart enough to make observations on their own. But I think, you know, nobody hopefully now really believes that. I mean, um, anyway, but so the first NSABP trial, so keep in mind, when you look at an NSABP trial, the name will give you an idea of what it is. B is breast, okay? C is colon, R is rectal, and then P we'll get to. Uh, but so this, this one, this trial was the, the first NSABP trial. It reported in 1977, and basically they took patients with operable breast cancer. They divided them into clinically node negative or clinically node positive, and for the node negative, they were randomized to one of three arms. So that's a radical mastectomy, just like Halstead did it, a total mastectomy, so now no axillary lymph node dissection um, or removal of the pec mi major or minor, total mastectomy plus XRT, and then the clinically node positive patients were randomized to a radical mastectomy or a total mastectomy with XRT. So they left those positive nodes there and they just radiated them. So keep in mind, this is, you know, again, really before chemo, chemo was being used, but it was sort of before the widespread adoption, at least in breast cancer, but radiation, you know, that, that had been around and it was trying to figure out what's the, the role for that. Because up until now, radiation was being used, but it was sort of being used inconsistently, things like that. Um, and so uh, in it, they enrolled 1,000 over a thousand clinically no negative, uh, 500 clinically no positive, um, and the primary outcomes were disease-free overall and relapse-free, Disney-free survival. Okay, so basically, if uh, you can see these Kaplan-Meyers, this is with you know 25 years of follow-up, but it was reported that the initial outcomes before that, um, and and the point here is that when you look at distant disease-free survival between the node negative women and the node positive women there's no difference. Overall survival, no difference. So I think the, the big point of that is um, it really doesn't matter what we do surgically in, 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 um, to the axilla, because that's really the big difference is what we're doing um, you know, surgically. The breast is coming out in every single one of these arms, but what we do to the axilla, whether it's nothing and no negative, or radiate, even radiating positive, it doesn't impact the overall distance, the chance of, of metastases. That's, that's kind of the point. They also showed um, basically um, that there was an increased risk of local regional recurrence in the um, no negative women, depending on what you did the axilla. That makes sense. If you do an axillary dissection versus nothing, and again, these women were not getting systemic therapy, um, that you had an increased risk of local occurrence. But again, that doesn't translate in the, in the long term to a, a survival benefit. Interestingly, you know, it didn't, radiation for clinically node positive was not better than an axillary dissection. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 this is also before mammography. So they had a really high rate of uh, positive nodes in the node negative arm. So um, probably not quite um, comparable to today's patients in that, in that standpoint. Um, okay, so that's all you need to remember from NSABV04 is basically, if one takeaway is what we do in the axilla probably doesn't matter from a surgical standpoint from outcomes. Now, you know, there is a role for what we do in the axilla for uh, determining systemic therapy. But when we debate about, you know, oh, we should go back, like our patient's already going to get chemo, things like that. You know, we've known for really 50 years that, almost 50 years, that what we do in the axilla doesn't impact survival. Okay. Um, okay. Now we have 1975. Basically, all you need to know is this is early chemotherapy days. They were using, uh, it's like a mustard analog, uh, LPAM, and that showed a, uh, a benefit in the adjuvant setting. Um, along comes CMF, and, um, and so this was the standard chemo really until like the 90s, or even into, yeah, kind of the mid to late 90s, um, 
and then in women with uh I think this was positive nodes. Yeah, node positive breast cancer. And so this showed a significant um, impact in overall survival. This is women with more than four positive nodes. This is any positive nodes. And you can see big impact in, um, in uh, disease-free survival anyway, and that translated into an overall survival benefit. So this was, uh, well, anyway, okay, that's, that's all you need to know. So that's basically, now we have 75, 76, you start to have chemotherapy play a role in the adjuvant setting. It was already playing a role in the metastatic setting, but now it's moved into the adjuvant setting, which keep in mind that, you know, that seems like sort of obvious now, but giving chemotherapy to someone who was clinically disease-free, this was radical. I mean, this was crazy at the time. Like, you know, these chemo drugs were not well tolerated. We were still trying to figure out how to use them. We were pushing them hard. Um, so to give them somebody who didn't have cancer, this was a big, big change in, in, in medicine, but that's, that's all the point I want to get across there. Okay. Um, so now, we go to NSABP B06. And so this is basically the death of the radical mastectomy. Um, so they'd already kind of pulled back from, from NSABP B04 and the radical mastectomy in terms of taking the um, PEC major and stuff. But now you have patients <laughs> with tumors less than four centimeters randomized to total mastectomy with an axillary dissection, a lumpectomy with an axillary dissection, or a lumpectomy with an axillary dissection plus XRT. So everybody gets an axillary dissection, but now we have the option of a lumpectomy. Um, so uh, if they were node positive, they received chemotherapy. That was a weird regimen, but that's what they were doing at the time. And so basically they showed that when you do a lumpectomy versus a lumpectomy plus radiation, you had significantly lower um, in-breast uh, or sorry, recurrences with, with the addition of radiation. Um, and if you look at it, this is about 12% with radiation and it goes up to 40% with, without radiation. Um, but there was no dis difference in disease-free survival. And that's because if you recurred they and you then resected that recurrence, they sort of didn't count that as disease-free, a disease-free event in, in that analysis, okay? So basically, Higher, if you do a lumpectomy, you have a higher local recurrence rate, but if you do the salvage mastectomy at that point, it doesn't count. You're still sort of on the same, same event rate, but no difference in distant and overall survival. So this 1985 is when breast conservation started, okay? Um, and again, this is why we do, you know, have historically said, if you do breast conservation, you get radiation with it because of that higher... Um, in breast tumor recurrence. This was actually trial was done before before that, but the I, I put the NSABP B B06 first just because it's the sort of the more uh, it was an American trial, it sort of established it. But the Milan study before that basically did not a lumpectomy, but a quadrantectomy um, for women with a two centimeter or less breast cancer. And then again, they got chemotherapy um, and showed essentially the same thing that with a breast conservation therapy, you had a higher risk of local recurrence. Let's see, let me go back to that. Yeah, a higher risk of local recurrence with breast conservation compared to a radical mastectomy, but uh, no difference in overall or um, uh, over in, in, in survival at the end of the day. So again, those two trials would establish breast conservation therapy um, in, in the early 80s. Okay, um, this is NSABP B13, published in 1989, and the, basically this is the start of hormonal therapy in the adjuvant setting, okay? That's all you need to know. It was beneficial. Um, so before that, you know, hormonal therapy wasn't part of the treatment plan, okay? Uh, NSABP B17, is basically uh, DCIS now resected by lumpectomy with negative margins. Now keep in mind that the DCIS of the early 90s is not the DCIS of today. This was just the start of mammography. So you had an uptick in DCIS because of that, but really it didn't have widespread uptake until kind of the, the 90s. And so this trial was largely enrolled before that. So DCIS before the 90s was like large palpable tumors typically. And so it was probably, you know, more aggressive disease in general. Um, but they were randomized 
to uh, this wasn't randomized. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It was lumpectomy versus XRT. Sorry. So um, basically, the point of this is that when we do ZCIS lumpectomy, there's up to a thirty in this trial. Again, not the DCIS of today, but a thirty-one percent in breast recurrence, and that half of them are invasive. Um, and you can decrease that risk by roughly half with the addition of um, XRT. This was also shown in EROTC 10853. Basically, don't need to remember that, but same, same things happened, okay? Um, about 30% of women recurred with DCIS with a lumpectomy alone, and half of them were invasive, and you reduced that risk by half. Um, and then a positive, closer positive margin increased the recurrence risk by 30%. Um, so that's that's kind of why we treat DCIS the way we do. You give radiation, you know, it, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Like this is a pre-invasive disease. Why are we giving radiation? Uh, it seems like over-treatment when you do a lumpectomy, but, but basically it's based on those two trials. And the other thing to remember when you're talking to patients is, I mean, this is kind of the point I remember from this is that if you have DCIS and you have a local recurrence, half of the time that's invasive disease. Okay, any questions on those? So they did, and, and that's the other thing to note is when I look back at these trials, you know, that, that a lot of these trials were, um, um, you know, we don't, I do think our surgical technique has improved, you know, in terms of localization, things like that, um, and, and probably the pathology techniques. Um, so I can't remember how they define a close margin, but they they showed that those positive, more close margins increase the recurrence. And that's so that's a whole nother line of, of trials and stuff and, and evidence and stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, we've ended up with the accumulated data, and these are included in those in, in those meta-analyses and things that sort of have given us our guidelines of, you know, you want no tumor on ink for a lumpectomy for invasive disease, and then two millimeter margins for DCIS. You know, the, um, we could talk about that another time, but I don't want to derail this. Um, yeah, you see that 21% had a less than one millimeter of positive margin. So that may also, you know, contribute to these high, high, because uh, you, you'll sometimes hear us in the back debating like, um, you know, the, 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 this, we're still stuck with the legacy of NSABP B13, or sorry, not B13, B, uh, B06 that showed, um, you know, you, you that you had a higher, local recurrence rate with um, breast conservation therapy than you do with a mastectomy. And so, you know, when I came up, the idea was breast conservation therapy is equivalent to a mastectomy. You do have a higher local recurrence rate, but when you do a salvage therapy, you know, you end up with no difference in overall survival or disease free survival. I think that's probably in general true, but if you present that to a patient that way and say, yeah, the chance of it coming back is higher, but we'll just do surgery again and you'll be just fine. Most women don't like that idea. You know, they're like, well, I'd rather just not have to deal with this again. And, and, and so just give me a mastectomy. But, uh, you know, we don't present it that way for a couple of reasons. One, it's sort of um, getting a little into the weeds. And, and sometimes I just think, you know, there's in general like a, society when i say society i mean like doctor society push to like that we're over treating women by doing too many mastectomies because especially if they're like no i'll just take a mastectomy with bilateral deep flaps you know um stay in the icu for 10 days for this like two centimeter tumor you know it, it, it's like it's just too much to digest at once but the other is uh, this recurrence rate is too high you know, given all the things that have changed. Our surgical techniques are better, our radiation is better, our systemic therapy, adjuvant systemic therapy is much more tailored and better. And so, you know, again, we don't have this high quality data from NSABP BR6, but um, most kind of modern series report an in-breast tumor recurrence, you know, more in the, you know, four to 5% sort of thing, which is 
becoming very approaching a, a rate that's similar to women who get a mastectomy. So it's probably still a little different, one to 2% different, but it's not dramatically different. Um, so anyway, just keep in mind as you present to women, um, you know, your options are breast conservation versus mastectomy. That sort of is data that's sort of hanging in the background about, well, is there a higher risk of local recurrence? And, and, and the truth is there probably is, but it's, it's probably not as big as we once thought. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. So these are the ones I'm still flying through. Um, may not seem like it. Okay. B an SABP P Z P one. What's the P anybody? Prevention. Very good. I always wanted to, you'd think it'd be prostate, but there's no prostate. Pill. Anyway. Um, and so basically again, this is, uh, women who, this is women who do not have breast cancer. So we're trying to prevent it. And so they picked high risk women which were defined as age greater than 60. So that alone was enough of a criteria or with a, a predicted risk of greater than 1.6% per year or a history of LCIS were randomly assigned to tamoxifen or placebo. And basically the risk of breast cancer was de and DCIS were decreased by half. In a specific group, ADH, it was decreased by 86%. And so, um, Basically, this just established tamoxifen as, um, you know, it can decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. So why isn't every woman on tamoxifen, uh, over 60 on tamoxifen? Yeah, so there's some risks with it. You know, one of the ones that's, you know, I think underappreciated is the risk of tolerance. I mean, women don't want to take a pill that gives them hot flash symptoms for five years, you know, when their risk of recurrence really um, in general is not high, uh, but then, yeah, so the, when, when we talk about uh, the risk of tamoxifen, there's a higher risk of DVT, a higher risk of endometrial cancer, um, and, and, and DVT and PE. So those are the kind of the two big risks, maybe a, a little bit higher risk of, of stroke as well, but it's basically thromboembolic events and endometrial cancer. Now, maybe they've had a hysterectomy, so that endometrial cancer goes well. In, in general, when you add those up, that risk is far, I mean, the, the risk of breast cancer reduction is greater than your increased risk of either of those two events, but still, you know, taking a, there, there are absolute risk of developing breast cancer for even in these, you know, higher risk women isn't that high. Um, so, there is a role, I think, for for tamoxifen uh, and for prevent, prevention of breast cancer. You know, I, I have sent every woman who has ADH in particular to go see the medical oncologist, but I swear, I don't think I've seen one of them treated. They always talk them out of it. Um, so, uh, but the other group that that probably, um, you know, ha is, is worth sending to see a medical oncologist is women who have a BRAC mutation because their risk is, you know, so high. And I think in general, this group, this patient had some BRCA patients in it, but there's other accumulated like meta-analysis data that suggests that there's, you know, that, that holds true, that BRCA women have a little bit higher predisposition towards triple negative breast cancer. Tamoxifen probably doesn't help for that, but they do get a lot of ERP or positive breast cancers as well. Um, the other thing is that nobody has owned this. Um, the medical oncologists are the ones who feel comfortable prescribing tamoxifen, but they don't want to see random women without breast cancer. Um, so the family practice doctors are probably the ones who should own this and they just haven't, they just haven't. Uh, it's not a drug they use. And so it's really, nobody's pushing this. It's probably, you know, a higher value option than doing PSAs uh, checking PSAs, to, for, but you know, that it's just, anyway, uh, I do feel like we should be using more of this. And so a lot of people do, a lot of people do, but, um, it hasn't, it, it is what it is. Um, okay. So, um, now we come to 2004, we're starting to pull back on breast can on, on, um, on chemotherapy and say, what if we just give adjuvant um, a radi uh, tamoxif tamoxifen, and basically they show that um, that helps not just with, uh, makes no, you know, patients do well from a, um, 
uh, or sorry, now we're starting to pull back on radiation. Sorry, if you give tamoxifen alone in women over 70, um, your in your local regional occurrence is higher, uh, but it's it's you know, and it's statistically significantly higher without the radiation, but the absolute risk is low. And so um, you may hear us talking, this basically the point of this is, this is not in your place to know, but if you hear us talking in the back about, well, patient's 80, you know, off, and it has an ER positive tumor that's small, will omit radiation. It's not because that patient wouldn't potentially benefit from a uh, local regional recurrence risk, it's just that absolute risk is so small, it's not worth it, okay? And so that's a discussion that the, usually the radiation oncologists have with women. But keep in mind, this is limited to women over 70 with ER, PR positive tumors. So it, it, all others don't apply, okay? Um, okay, so this is NSAPP B32. So this is basically, you know, uh, it, it's it's here listed as 2007. So that's basically when when uh, when I started residency is when we st like sent a lymph node biopsies. They were adopted very quickly, so it was probably it was before this, based on some other data. But this is the data that showed sent a lymph node biopsy is an okay thing to do. Before this, you know, like before, yeah, like before 2000, women all got axillary dissections. And now we like rarely do actually those sections, but anyway, um, and so they basically randomized women to um, a sentinel lymph node followed by an axillary dissection versus sentinel lymph node um, with uh, if they had a positive node, they got an axillary dissection. If the node was negative, no axillary dissection. So group two is sort of a randomized uh, is a uh, sorry, yeah. So you're comparing these two groups. Um, for for outcomes, but then you also get because this group didn't just get an axillary dissection, you also get false negative rate data from this alone. So this is sort of a trial in and of itself of what's the false negative rate. They set an arbitrary upfront false negative rate of ten percent as acceptable. Okay, and what did they achieve? They achieved a false negative rate of nine point eight percent. So that was an okay thing to do. But more importantly, when you evaluated the two groups. Um, there was no difference in axillary node recurrence, disease-free, or overall survival. Um, they had a 97% technical success rate. Um, and then um, getting a needle biopsy of abnormal feeling nodes or getting more nodes out decreased that false negative rate in subset analyses. That's kind of point through. So this is the start of sentinel lymph nodes. Keep that 9.8% you know, in mind as what was acceptable. Um, they uh, went back after the fact, they had all these nodes banked, and then said, well, what if we look again? Because at the time, they were just dividing the nodes in half and looking at um, the positive, basically just H&E, and &E, if, it was, if it had cancer, it was positive. They went back and cut them up more um, and looked for, uh, with immunohistochemistry, and basically found that about 16% of the um, women who had negative sentinel lymph nodes actually were positive. Most of the time it was with isolated tumor cells. So that's less than 200 micrometers or a cluster of 200 cells, something like that. Um, um, but then, you know, it was rare that they missed a macro met, but, um, and then when they looked at the group that had a cult positive nodes, there was a difference, albeit small, in uh, disease-free and overall survival. Um, that difference was less pronounced with the group that had isolated tumor cells. And this was viewed as statistically, but not clinically significant. So because of this, when I, this was kind of happening during my residency, we were doing serial sectioning of sentinel nodes. So they take a node, they cut it a whole bunch of times, and then do immunohistochemistry on it. To, to look for those. Um, and, and then that continued until ACASOG Z10, which I'll follow on next. But they, these were two trials, kind of one and the same. Um, so this is Z11. So this is probably the first trial I'm talking about that you, you should know by name, okay? Um, so Z11, up until then, up until now, you know, 
in SABPB 32 kind of ruled the day. If you did a single lymph node, if you had a positive node, you did an axillary dissection. And the idea was basically that, you know, that was a trial to determine in a safer way than an axillary dissection who had positive nodes. But we were still, you know, this is kind of the legacy of Halstead, that if you had disease in the axilla, it needed to be surgically removed. Otherwise, it would be left behind. Eventually, it would spread and, and the woman would die of metastatic disease. And so Z11 had the idea of, well, if you had a positive single lymph node, um, that you'd be randomized to axillary dissection with no further axillary surgery. So there were pretty stringent criteria for who could get into it. You had to be, uh, you had to be um, T1 or 2, clinically node positive, uh, clinically node negative, um, and have breast conservation therapy. You couldn't have an axillary, or you couldn't have a mastectomy. Um, also, you know, one thing that's notable is every trial that we've talked about so far, with the exception of one, hasn't differentiated women by triple negative breast, the triple negative, HER2 positive. You know, up until now, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, the those subtypes didn't impact the surgical treatment. It did impact the chemo. And again, we're not doing as many chemo things, but um, you know, we, we saw when tamoxifen emerged in the adjuvant setting, you know, HER2 emerged around 2000 in the adjuvant setting. Um, but for the most part, all breast cancer sort of lumps together into, you know, this is how it's done. So as we go forward from here, you, now you start to see a lot more differentiation by types, but now, you know, the indications for, for um, chemotherapy weren't really dependent on that. It was just if you had, um, uh, you know, up until this point, basically, if you had a tumor that was certainly greater than a centimeter, if you were healthy, greater than two centimeters, if you weren't that healthy, or no positive, everybody got chemo, okay? Um, so almost all these women got chemo. Uh, and so they were randomized, again, to axillary dissection or just nothing. Importantly, it wasn't to axillary radiation, it was to just nothing. And so this trial took forever and it didn't complete its enrollment because basically people didn't believe they thought it was unethical or they weren't willing to enroll their patients in it. So eventually, shoot. Um, so it basically it enrolled less than half of the women intended, 891 of a planned 1900 women. Um, and so they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to those. Most patients received chemo. Um, and basically, there was no difference in um, survival or disease-free survival. Um, and so the, the thing that's notable about that is, uh, you know, it did, it's people, the critique of this trial is not that it was underpowered. Uh, that is a critique of it. But I mean, I think basically people accept it because there's not like a hint of a difference. If anything, when you look at this, it's that the uh, sinal lymph node arm is better, you know, I mean, not statistically, but it's not like there was a trend that, oh, if it had been adequately powered, no one critiques it that way because the, the data didn't show that. Um, so basically, this is why we stopped doing so many axillary dissections. Um, you know, the, the five-year local recurrence rate was lower in the sinal lymph node arm, not statistically lower, but it's, again, there's not like you can say, well, if we added more patients, it's likely to go the other way. The critique of this trial, though, comes from that, again, it probably had to do with the radiation oncologist feeling uncomfortable with it, but almost half of the patients got axillary radiation um, off protocol. And it wasn't, they didn't call it axillary radiation. They said they did breast radiation with high tangents. But when you do high tangents, you like can't help but get radiation through the axilla. And so the radiation oncologist went back and be like, well, you know, oh, some of them got axillary radiation. So there's that, um, plus the Amaros trial is why we radiate women with excellent, with, uh, after, with a positive sinal lymph node after, um, after uh, well, after surgical, after, sur after surgery. Um, so just hold that thought for the Amaros trial. Um, the other thing is that along with this trial, they did uh, another observational trial where, um, women uh, received uh, IHC of their sinal lymph node, um, and, and also they got bone marrow aspirations. And, and so these trials were enrolled together, same, same inclusion criteria, but basically 
women got standard evaluation of their sentinel lymph node for, for Z11, but then after the fact, they did a, a serial sectioning and, I, and immunized to chemistry, basically to find smaller involvement of those nodes, but they didn't tell anyone the results and they just followed those women. And basically they showed that um, isolated tumor cells were, um, didn't matter. Um, so there was no difference. Um, yeah, in the, in the tenant, 0.5% of women who had positive uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, it didn't matter um, for survival. Bone marrow, having bone marrow involvement did matter, but the rate of it was so low that it's not worth doing. It's, it's too much risk for, to get that out of it. Um, so basically, this is why you don't have to do IHC for, um, to evaluate sentinel nodes. Now, if you go to BC4, you'll see that they very often do IHC on sentinel lymph nodes. Do you know why that is? Anybody? Yeah, it's easy. It's like, you know, I could read, a, I could read IHC. It's like, if there's brown in the node, it's positive. So it makes it very quick for them. So that's probably more of a BAMCism than, because uh, if you have to pay for those reagents and bill somebody, the insurance won't cover it. But here, it doesn't matter makes it easy. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, so amaros, and basically done at the same time as Z11, uh, or at least overlapping. And so basically women with positive, uh, with, uh, with positive central lymph node were randomized to an axillary dissection versus axillary radiation. So Z11 was randomized to nothing versus axillary dissection. Now we got radiation versus axillary dissection. And um, basically they showed that 33% um, of patients had a positive nodes on the axillary dissection. That's similar to Z11, 27% of women had positive uh, lymph nodes in the axillary dissection. So basically what we're saying in that is that it's because it's randomized, 27% of women didn't get anything done, had disease left in their axilla, but it didn't make a difference. And Amaros, similarly, 30, about a third of women had disease left in their axilla, but this time we'll blast them. Um, and so basically the recurrence rate was lower in the axillary radiation group, but it wasn't uh, statistically different. And um, that lymphedema was higher with axillary dissection than radiation alone. And so now you have two trials, both of which show no benefit to axillary dissection in um, um, women who have a positive sentinel lymph node, one with radiation, one without, but the radiation oncologists believe their, their trial, and so they get radiation. And it's one of those things, it's like, this is, we can't stop them from doing it. Like if we say we're going to do nothing and they say, well, we're going to give radiation, we can't be like, no. It's, I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's sort of the same thing that we do to the medical oncologist sometimes, though. Like when we say we want neoadjuvant therapy and they say we want you to do surgery and we say, well, we're just not going to. And so then they have to do radiation. They have to do chemotherapy. Um, so it is what it is. Um, you know, eventually, I think we will we'll back off on this, but it's going to take another trial to basically compare now, not axillary dissection versus radiation, but nothing versus radiation. I know. With the, the, they have an, they, I didn't include it in here, but there is one trial. There's, there's a couple trials, one in particular that shows a survival benefit to axillary radiation in, po in clinically positive women. And they, man, they, they cling to that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it is what it is. So I think we give a lot of unnecessary radiation and, um, you know, the, the radiation oncologist will, you'll see, just listen for it. Sometimes they're like, is this is radiation. And then other times they're like, if they don't want to do it, they'll be like, I don't know. There's a lot of risk with this. Uh, it'll be the same in the same patient uh, or same radiation protocol. But anyway, um, yeah, it was a big deal because basically Z11, the findings of that were so radical of not doing an axillary dissection that there was a lot of, initially, a lot of hesitancy to push it beyond 
the 11 criteria because you didn't want to be like, well, you know, not doing an exercise to be like, well, it's, you know, it's a T3 tumor. I mean, T3s are big, don't get me wrong, but like you, you wouldn't, if we did a mastectomy, they have to get an accident dissection. And this pushed us more towards doing breast conservation in some ways, at least for a little while. Um, and then Amaro's came along and um, then it was all okay to do it with an accident dissection, but it was also, everybody got radiation anyway. Okay. So now, you know, up until now, again, things haven't really been divided by breast cancer subtypes. Now, all of a sudden, that, that that starts to become a bigger deal. And it is, you know, now, th keep in mind that, you know, this is AJCC 7 and before when all breast cancers staged the same. Now, with AJCC 8, we stage each subtype differently. The staging is very complicated, but it's much more accurate. Because triple negative breast is not the same as a grade 1 ER positive ERPR positive HER2 negative tumor, they're just not. And so, and that's true. I mean, it does impact uh, how we do things surgically. And so now we start to get into to trials now, you know, you're not gonna find a trial now, almost in any breast cancer setting that enrolls all comers breast cancer. It's just, you know, we divide it by those groups because they behave differently um, and they're treated differently now too. So because of that, you know, there were certain groups uh, that were pushing for more chemotherapy up front for women who are clearly going to get chemotherapy. Um, at first, the indications for neoadjuvant chemo were if you wanted breast conservation, but because of the breast cancer size and your breast size, you weren't a candidate. We knew that chemo could shrink that. We knew that chemo up front or afterwards didn't make a difference in overall outcomes. But basically, that was the reason. If you can shrink it and it changed the surgery, fine, we'll do it up front. Otherwise, we'll do it on the back end because they're going to get it anyway. Women don't like having, knowing their tumors there. You know, that's just the way we've always done it. So those sorts of things. We, people recognized pretty quickly that the response to chemo was, was prognostic. You know, that if patients had a good response, they did much better than those who you know, had less of a response or even worse, those who progressed, those patients did really badly. And so, you know, those who were pushing upfront chemo were like, well, we want that prognostic information. Those who were against it were like, doesn't change anything. You know, it's the outcome's the outcome. Like telling a woman they're more likely to die doesn't make things better or worse, just makes it what it is. Um, so that was that. But regardless, there was more chemo giving it up front. And so it, it led to this question of what do you do in the women who have clinically no positive disease and they um, get chemo and then we do, you know, surgery afterwards. And a lot of them have a complete response in their axilla. You know, how can we, how can we uh, avoid that? So there were things people for a little while were doing if you wanted to give new adjuvant, you take them to the OR, do the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and then give them the chemo. Uh, but that, you know, it's an extra surgery. It was sort of a reason not to do new adjuvant if you had to do that. Um, so along comes Z1071 and says, well, let's see how good uh, axillary dissection is after sentinel, after new adjuvant chemo. And so in this case, the primary endpoint was just false negative rate. So they had uh, sent a lymph node, and then they did an axillary dissection in these women who were clinically no negative, but got chemotherapy. And the endpoint was false negative rate, which was set at 10%, just like B32. Okay. And they found that the sent lymph node was not identified in 7.1%. So those patients got an axillary dissection. Um, and that basically 41% of women had a pathologic complete response. But in those that didn't, um, cancer was found in 39% of women with a negative sentinel lymph node, which led to a false negative rate of 12.6%. So therefore, cannot do sentinel lymph node alone after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, you know, that's, that's how it is viewed. It's black and white. Now, remember, what was the false negative rate in B32? 9.7%. So it was like just a little different. but you know, those are the cutoffs that were made and it was pre-specified. So, you know, if you found more than three sentinel lymph nodes, it dropped below 10%. If you use two agents, it got 
better. So some of us would, you know, debate about, well, I really don't want to do an axial section this way. If I can find three sentinel lymph nodes and use two agents, it'll be fine. You know, in, in reality, that absolute difference is very small, but it is what it is. And that's where this whole idea of you got to get three nodes out front. But I mean, some women, it just drains to one node and only one node. You can't make a non sentinel lymph node a sentinel lymph node just because you want it to be. And so um, anyway, that was that. So uh, to address that, actually, I, I, I just realized I didn't include it, is what we do now is it's not, it is a landmark trial, but it's not a major randomized trial, but it's, it was uh, the targeted axillary dissection trial. So instead of just doing a single lymph node, we put a seed in a node that was positive up front, and then we take that cliff node out, and that dro drops the false negative rate below 5%. And so that's that's what's done. Uh, okay, so the other thing to note, and this is impacts how we do this, is that really Z11 or Amaros and Z11 both counted, didn't include women with clinically node positive, but how was clinically node positive defined? Was that? No, it was palpable. So, you know, they weren't doing axillary ultrasounds and, you know, you, you imagine, you know, you have a 250 pound woman, four foot tall, and they're like, it has to be a big node to be able to feel that. But that patient would be included in this trial with an axial ultrasound. You can find, you know, two millimeters of cortical thickening that's asymmetric. And that, that's counted too. Un, unquestionably, that patient would have been clinically node negative and fallen into this. But now all of a sudden they're clinically node positive and, you know, Whichever algorithm you follow leads to an axillary dissection at some point if they don't have a pathologic complete response. And so that's why um, we don't get axillary ultrasounds necessarily reflexively anymore. Um, or sorry, that's not true. We do. We don't get, we don't have them biopsy abnormal nodes reflexively until we've seen the pathology because we just can call it suspicious. It's not proven axillary positive. Because ultimately, if you biopsy that two millimeters of cortical thickening and, you know, the 80-year-old lady with an ER positive one centimeter tumor, all of a sudden, you know, you end up doing an axillary dissection on her when, you know, she, she probably almost certainly wouldn't benefit from that. Um, we can talk more about that later, but okay, I want to cover a couple other trials and we're running out of time. So... Uh, Taylor RX. This trial, you know, before this, before Taylor RX, if you had, um, it was getting pulled back a little bit, but, but basically most women got chemotherapy, and so um, even ERPR positive tumors, ERPR positive HER2 negative tumors make up you know 60, 65 percent of breast cancer, so the bulk of them. Um, and this took patient patients with basically T1 or two tumors um, that are ER positive, and then divided women who had a low risk, they already knew from retrospective data that this low risk group had did well, didn't did well in general, but they took those women and assigned them to hormone therapy. The intermediate risk group was randomized to chemo or hormonal therapy. And then the high risk group has always gotten chemotherapy. And so basically it was an observational study and a randomized trial together. Initially the observational study came out and basically showed that, um, for the low risk group, the overall survival, um, the disease-free and overall survival were just really, really good. So you couldn't, you couldn't design a trial big enough to show an improvement in that. So that, that's, that's never, there's never been a randomized trial in the low risk group, but the results sort of just speak for themselves. You don't need chemo. Um, in, the, in the intermediate group, basically, um, the there was no difference either and so those uh the, it, there is like this uh subset of premenopausal women with a 20 to 25 because 25 is the cutoff who may have a little bit of benefit that you might hear the medical oncologist talk about but basically what you need to know for the most part is a low or intermediate score um you don't need chemo okay um the responder trial is, and this again, I mean, it's like, if you just shown this to Halstead, maybe not Halstead, but uh, I don't know, Martin 20 years ago, he would have passed out. Um, but um, basically now we take women who have 
um, a positive or positive nodes and um, randomize women with a, a recurrence score of less than 25 to, um, uh, it was one to three positive nodes uh, to chemo versus hormonal therapy or hormonal therapy alone. Again, it's in the low or intermediate risk group, not the high risk group. Um, and basically they showed that in postmenopausal women, no difference. In premenopausal women, there is a small difference in, uh, in, in, in recurrence. And so the way this is interpreted, so what's the difference between a premenopausal and a postmenopausal breast cancer? So again, this is only for women with HER2 negative, ERP or positive tumors. But uh, why do you think that is? I'm just gonna tell you in the answer to time. The, the, there is a thought that basically the chemo ablates their premenopausal women's ovaries, and that's what makes the difference. And so there are other ways you can ablate ovaries. You can do that surgically, you can remove them, um, or you can give ovarian suppression with um, Lupron, things like that. So, you know, it's still, but that hasn't been, that's not what we have randomized data for. So basically, if you're premenopausal and you're node positive, the standard of care right now is chemo. If you're postmenopausal and node, excuse me, node positive, ERP or positive, HER2 negative, and your recurrence score is less than 25, you don't need chemo. Um, okay, I don't know if I have time to cover these. So basically, the point of this is, this is a residual cancer burden. It's a score of how much tumor you have left after chemo. And in um, HER2 positive tumors, or sorry, triple negative tumors, and HER2 positive tumors in particular, it really makes a big difference in prognosis. And so this is the whole idea of, we knew that the response to chemo in the dehydrated setting made a big difference, but what are you gonna do about it? And so basically the, what are you gonna do about it is they took all these women with the lower lines and then said, what if we give them a different therapy? Now we give them more chemo. They've already gotten the normal amount of chemo, but what if we give them something different if they have a less than pathologic free response? So we're already separating out the half of the group that does uh, better, or sorry, that does taking the better group out and create X uh, randomized women to um, capsidabine uh, with basically HER2 negative tumors. And the bottom line is the triple negative subgroup of that had a significant improval in um, disease-free and overall survival. Um, Similarly, in the Catherine trial, they took women who had uh, HER2 positive tumors who had a less than pathologic complete response and randomized them to complete their normal amount of adjuvant um, and or give TDM1, which is an antibody drug conjugate. It's treptuzumab plus some tanzine and basically showed a survival there. So that's why basically all women, especially if they're not positive with triple negative breast cancer, or HER2 positive breast cancer should get neoadjuvant therapy. I know I'm kind of flying through these now. Um, I just want to mention this one that, so this was recently reported at ASCO, but basically women, this is in the metastatic setting. This is women with, uh, who got trastuzumab deruxetan, which is a different antibody drug conjugate. I know I'm over it I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, uh, were randomized to, to this drug versus physician's choice. They were all pretreated. Um, the thing that's important about this is it's get, this will change how we view breast cancer in the next five or 10 years. Right now, things are sort of neatly defined into ERPR positive, HER2 negative, triple negative, and HER2 positive. And that's how they're treated based on those divisions. But now all of a sudden, these are women who have HER2 low expressing tumors. So they do express some HER2, but it's not the driver of their disease. You know, in HER2 positive disease, it's very clear that if you treat that HER2, it's because you're blocking the function of that HER2 and that leads to a better outcome. But now we're using HER2 not to block its driving capacity, but almost more as a tumor localizing agent. So instead of using it to block that, we're using it to get the antibody drug conjugate to the tumor and that will kill it. And so uh, to deliver that payload, that chemotherapy payload. And so now you have basically both triple negative and ER positive women who have her low to her expression, both all benefited from um, this drug. It will likely move forward in the treatment arm, 
but now it's going to get really confusing because you're going to have a subgroup of triple negative HER2 low expressing, and then you're going to have triple negative that's like super negative that has no HER2, and you're going to have ERPR positive HER2 positive HER2 low expressing, HER2 negative. So I don't know how we're going to handle all that naming convention, but it will get. So if it's HER2 high expressing, yeah, you use, I think this drug will probably, it's probably better than it, trastuzumab and tanzine, but that's not what this trial studied. So it, it will have to prove it better. It's better than the current standard of care in HER2 overexpressing disease. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. That's not true. We wouldn't benefit it. Okay, just last slide. Yeah, I mean, women benefited. I mean, it's a lot better. Like, I didn't, I, I could go into more of that trial, but I, I, the bottom line is there's, there's a lot of trials that are coming out that you're going to be, uh, that are going to be, uh, this one I still don't understand why I hadn't read out, but um, axillary ultrasound versus sentinel lymph node. We may just stop doing sentinel lymph nodes in a lot, large number of patients. Okay, and then the COMET trial is basically observation or just hormonal therapy for low risk DCIS. Um, and then, you know, the NSABP B51 will probably stop doing radiation in women who have a pathologic complete response. Right now they get it, but this trial, I mean, those women we know have a very low local occurrence rate. Um, and then uh, NSABP B52 basically adds estrogen deprivation in the new adjuvant setting. Anyway, those are all trials I'm excited to see, but. Yeah.